Let me start by thanking the organizers for uh, accommodating my um, needs that have changed. I wish I could be there with you, but uh, as the saying goes, when uh, life hands you lemon juice, make lemons and life will be like, what? Um, that was supposed to generate some laughter. Uh, let's see if my presentation can. I will start my presentation, which means that I will disappear into the ether and all you will see is my slides, but I hope you'll keep hearing my voice. So, this is what triggered uh, the thoughts I'd like to share with you today. A handful of quotes that I found in a recent uh, publication made by Daphne Collar, whom you might know. She is the head of uh, Coursera in California, which is a hub of free online education. And she said that uh, she anticipates it not taking more than five years for top universities to offer full-fledged undergraduate degrees online. She also said that online education should not be mistaken uh, to be this ideal of a handful of people sitting around a seminar room and being deeply engaged with a trainer and that so far it hasn't really been technology that has kept universities from offering such courses or degrees, but rather the fear of being seen as moving away from this ideal of offering uh, personal tuition. So this is the premise for my presentation, as is this. A quote I found in doing a little bit of research, apparently, one can at least perfect one's interpreting skills from home, the beach, the park, a cafe, or somewhere in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Killian, I'm very sorry to interrupt you. Could you move your image? We still can see a little screen there, but it's blocking the quotation. So maybe you can move it to the top right corner all the way. Is it? Can I, I can do not do have. Oh, can I, I do, do not have here? any screen anywhere ah, that maybe, you would ah. have to do. I, yeah, I don't know. I, it doesn't work for me. I don't know. Maybe can somebody help? But okay, we'll bear with you unless help arrives. Yeah, I can't. Um, I can't move it. I'm afraid it doesn't move. Okay, we'll just continue. Uh, should I turn off my camera altogether? It's fine. All right, so here we go. Uh, this is the topic of my presentation. Is the training of conference centers online a vision or is it merely an illusion? The line between a vision and an illusion is rather thin. And yet, whereas one has to do with uh, imagining, anticipating, and projecting, projecting a likely truth, or at least a possible truth. The other one has to do with deceit, with misleading somebody, um, and projecting something that is certainly not true. I will argue that in the case of training conference interpreters online, this line is constituted by pedagogical and technological limitations. And I will dwell first and foremost on the pedagogical ones, knowing full well that the program is replete with presentations on new technology. So I don't think I'll have to say too much about those. But to do that, I'm going to take a step back. A step back and look at a completely different field Architecture, for example. If you want to become an architect, this is roughly what you're in for. 
a sizable number of theoretical lectures on spatial reasoning, on construction technology, on structural technology, on modern and postmodern architecture, and to a lesser extent, practical experience, usually gathered as part of either individual or collaborative projects in civil engineering and urban planning, and so on and so forth. After that, usually three to four years, you're sent out into the world and you take on your job as an architect. Let's look at the medical profession. This is a fictitious medical curriculum, an amalgamation of different curricula found. But basically, you spend the first two years learning the theory of biochemistry, cell biology, neurosciences, pathology. You look into clinical diagnosis and also things like uh, health law and so on and so forth. And those two years are followed by the so-called clinical years, two years of practice through clerkships, where you learn about family medicine, internal medicine, obstetrics, about general surgery, different specialties, uh, going all the way to psychiatry and neurology. After that, you still do a residency period of anywhere between three and five years depending on the specialization. A period during which, as a young doctor, you are followed closely by an experienced doctor and you learn on the job. So let us look what interpreters do. The curriculum foresees very little theory, lectures on perhaps the history of interpreting, conference interpreting, about the process, something on parliamentary procedure, maybe some language for special purposes, international organizations, but that's usually where it ends. And then there's a lot of practice, and seminars and practice groups to, as uh, is usually argued, acquire the skill of sight translating, of note taking, of consecutive interpreting, of simultaneously interpreting, of uh, text analysis, of text preparation. After that program, you're sent off into the world and you can get a job as a conference interpreter. The EMCI, probably well known to all of you, is an EU-sponsored consortium of flagship training institutions. And they call for the ratio between theory and practice to be one of 25 to 75. When it comes to contact hours between trainers and learners. If you look very closely, you'll see that they also encourage learner-learner exchanges and if you add those to the equation, the actual ratio between theory and practice is more in the ballpark of 90 to 10. So where does that take us? The training model for conference interpreting has not changed a great deal over the well, 75 years of existence of formal conference interpretive training. There are three tiers to that model. The first axiom is that interpretive training programs don't teach the what, so they do not teach declarative knowledge, but they teach the how to, procedural knowledge. The second one says that professionals should be training soon to be professionals. The master, in other words, knows best. And the third axiom is one that was shown before. Interpreters need to perform the task to learn the task. 
it is uh, fine and well to be talking about the history of interpreting, but unless you actually sit in the booth and interpret, chances are you will not become a good interpreter. Now, those of you who have, uh, and I suppose that is uh, the majority in the room, given some thought to training, have uh, come across the principle of uh, expertise and uh, this notion coined by Erickson in the 90s, uh, expertise based on deliberate practice. Uh, I think the ballpark figures were 10,000 hours to be invested within this framework of deliberate practice will make, well, I should, I, should, I should turn it around and say, if you want to become an expert in any field, then that's what you need. 10,000 hours of deliberate practice. So I'm looking at somebody who uh, enters an MA in conference interpreting this year, the fall 2016. This person will, if we stick to the EMCI core curriculum and their recommendations and the number of hours, the minimum number of hours, let's say we're generous and give them 500 contact hours of deliberate practice during the first year and an extra 500 during the second year. We are quite a ways away from the 10,000 hours needed to become an expert interpreter. And yet, ideally, at the end of 2017, this uh, young candidate will have gone through the program and graduate and be a professional interpreter only to become an expert farther down the road. I would like to talk about a few assumptions, assumptions we have about training conference interpreters. The first one concerns the first tier, procedural knowledge. We have very high expectations of our candidates. We say that what we are there to do is to teach them a skill, not content. They need to come in with above average language skills. They need to come in with above average encyclopedic knowledge. They need to come in with above average knowledge of current affairs. And yet we all know that everybody comes in with a little room for improvement. We also make assumptions about the trainers themselves. You remember the second tier, professionals as trainers and the master knows best. We assume that the trainers involved in training conference interpreters, so the professionals who actually train, are above average when it comes to their own awareness. So their ability to understand what they do, when they do it, how they do it, and why they do it. They have above average pedagogical skills. They know about progression, about students' needs, about communication, about feedback. And they're available, they're interested, and they're willing to teach. There again, I think we can all agree that there is some room for improvement across the board. And then there's a third assumption that was uh, really captured well in the recommendations laid down by the EMCI uh, consortium. Time on task. These programs need to be very practically oriented and you need to be exposed to a certain number of hours of training, of actual deliberate practice of the thing, rather than just contemplating uh, and talking about the thing. And there too, I think there's uh, some room for improvement. Now, the question arises whether with the changes that have happened 
over the past 75 years in terms of technology that is being used in the booth, but also technology that's available to us to train people who will then be in the booth. Um, don't warrant a rethinking of these axioms. And if we don't, do we run the risk of, of trying to just push the square peg through the round hole? So let's look at the different tiers. The first tier had to do with uh, declarative knowledge. And I think it is fair to say that a number of shortcomings in this first tier can be addressed with tools and resources that are available online already. They're generic, they're not specific, they were probably not ever even devised for conference interpreters, and often they're not proprietary, so they're for free. I'm thinking of silly things such as Duolingo or Babel to improve your language skills. And even if it were in this particular software or, uh, or program, one devised along these lines would probably do the trick. You can up your encyclopedic knowledge uh, by looking at how stuff works. A web page that explains things to the man and the woman in the street, even those of more complex nature. And if you want to catch up on current affairs, I think all you need to do is download an app from one of the major news outlets. And that should allow you to uh, go a little bit beyond the just above average. So what about the, the second tier then? These are the trainers and their profile. What is out there to help professional interpreters who want to train other interpreters to become more aware of what they do and to acquire pedagogical skills? Well, they're actually a whole range of, I shouldn't say a whole range, but there is at least a handful of, of possibilities out there. Uh, there are certificates, there are full-fledged master, uh, master's degrees, uh, AIC offers courses, uh, a number of other organizations, local associations also offer courses, so there are courses out there. When it comes to their availability, I'm not 100% sure because it is true that theoretically the World Wide Web makes trainers available anytime, anywhere. But, and we'll look at that in a minute, there are other constraints that make me qualify that statement. I think the most important here is the third one. The amount and the type of practice. And I'd like to focus on this one and uh, look at where changes have taken place in terms of the training approach to conference interpreters. I talked before about deliberate practice and today's successful models of training conference interpreters or training in general, I should say, include several layers of feedback provided by different actors, by trainers, as you can see here at the top, and then clockwise by tutors, by peers, and by the learners themselves. They all have a different profile. In the case of conference interpreting, the trainers, so the traditional trainers, would be seasoned professionals, who ideally are pedagogical experts, who master the skill and who understand the task that they carry out. The tutors would be newbie interpreters, recent graduates with a certain degree of pedagogical notions and with the, the basic notions or should I say, the mastery of the skill and uh, some advanced, basic advanced notions of the process. So uh, what they're lacking as compared to uh, 
the trainer is definitely the experience. We'll talk about how much experience actually adds in a second. Then there are peers. They're learners, just like learner X himself. And they have basic notions of, uh, of the process, ideally, if those basic notions have been conveyed in a theoretical class. And the learner, him or herself, again, with basic notions of the process. All of them differ in a number of different uh, parameters. For example, the trainer will have the most authority, followed by the tutor, the peer, and the self. And this is a completely artificial scale. Uh, this is, this is uh, not a metric that was applied. It was simply meant to illustrate uh, the, the different profiles of the actors involved. When it comes to proximity, pr proximity as in kinship, it's quite the opposite picture. And the trainer will be perceived as being the farthest removed from the learner situation, followed by um, the tutor and the peer and the person him or herself. How much do they know about the process? Well, ideally, the trainer will know the most. The peer and the self will probably know the least, with the tutor being somewhere in between. Similar situation for teaching approaches. Trainers, however, tend to be the least available because they're top professionals. And that's, according to the model that we encourage, the ones we want to train our students, followed by tutors, peers, and the person him or herself. And they're also the most costly because they are top professionals who can fill their days with lucrative interpreting assignments rather than poorly paid training hours. So the question is, which of these interactions should be um, taking place? So the feedback interactions in ordinary brick and mortar residency-based face-to-face modalities, and which ones should be happening online? And to give more thought to that, I think um, we need to look at two parameters. I'll do that in a second. But the question is, should feedback first and foremost be provided by professional trainers? Or rather, by tutors? Should it be mainly coming from peers? Or should it be first and foremost based on self-assessment and self-feedback? The trainer, as we saw before, is not very available and costs a lot. So logically, that would be a good candidate to be providing feedback online. The tutor is moderately available, but comes at a moderate cost. So here, we can opt for either. The peer is probably very highly available and comes at a low cost, as most residency programs have at least two or three students in the same language combination. And the students themselves, taken as individuals, should be very highly available and come at a very low cost. Jump back to the deliberate practice cycle, which, if broken down succinctly, looks like this. Preparation, setting of objective, performance, feedback, integration, repeat many times. But it's more than that. There is a cycle within the cycle. The performance feedback cycle ideally should be uh, not a one-off, but go through a number of iterations, and ideally should be happening in real time. And we know that the farther removed, so temporally removed, 
the feedback is from the performance, the less effective and the less well received it is by the learner. Scenario. We have um, student one in Vancouver, student two in Montreal, trainer in Europe. Geographical distance can be overcome through the web, but remains an issue because of the time difference. It means that scheduling a class is sheer impossible, or you only have a sliver of the day during which you can have a class with these students, unless you are willing to impose what I call crazy hours and people having to get up at ungodly hours at one end or at the other. So it is not really sustainable. Technology. Is it possible to ensure the same quality of connectivity among a large number or even just a small number of participants? I think uh, you, you've had some examples today of the variability that's built into that system. Every so often, without anyone being at fault, it might just be that the connection you end up with is not good. The problem is, that it leads to the Skype effect, which is the frustration you feel when usually loved ones freeze on the screen in some sort of awkward grimace. And it also leads to the survival of the fittest, meaning that if there are more than one or two people involved, the ones with the slower connections will simply fade to the sidelines and eventually disappear and not interact with the trainer anymore. Efficiency, yes, can bypass the problem of multi-point uh, connectivity by simply replacing it with a one-to-one -one tutoring from or by the trainer. But that is extraordinarily costly because there are very few synergies the trainer can exploit. Every student is different. Every performance is different, even though the materials might be the same. What happens when you use tutors? There is one main challenge to overcome, and that is acceptance. The tutor, unlike the trainer, is unknown. The tutor, unlike the trainer, has very little experience. The tutor, unlike the trainer, has probably not got professional affiliation with anyone yet. So it is important to give tutors skills on one hand to enable them, but also give them credentials. Peers, why not simply bypass all of these obstacles and focus on peer feedback? Better yet, make it a, uh, a zero-sum game. Set up a peer feedback exchange. The issue there is one of guaranteeing that it's a give and take. Who puts in what and who gets out what? Depending on programs, on curricula, on prerequisites, the levels among what we call peers might well vary disparate. Some might be a No, we lost you. Sorry, the sound is gone. Okay. All right. Uh, you woke up. <laughs> Am I back? Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you. Voila. The challenge with uh, self-assessment and feedback, if that is what we focus on most, is the risk of alienating the learner 
and leaving the learner with too many doubts as to whether or not they're doing things correctly. Besides, if I can basically teach myself, then how difficult can this task possibly be? What I'm trying to say is there might even be a risk to the reputation of the profession if we conceive a, a program that relies too heavily on self-assessment. I'm coming back to the deliberate practice model. And looking at these four, I think one can group the trainers and the tutors in one group and the students into another group. And if the idea is to maximize efficiency and return an investment, then the answer would probably have to be that it is tutors and peers who should provide feedback online. The conclusion is therefore that if we can ensure that peers on an online platform are matched in terms of requirements they have to fulfill to enter their programs. And the progression throughout their programs is matched. In other words, if we can ensure that there's a fair exchange going on and nobody gets shortchanged, then this might indeed be part of a vision of training conference interpreters online. And similarly, if the idea of tutors that are trained up to better understand the process and to better understand pedagogical principles, things that today they sometimes have, but only if they're at the same time teaching and or research assistants. And if we give them enough institutional support, so some sort of recognition or affiliation, then I think that too can be part of a vision as in the anticipation of something that is likely to become true. When it comes to top flight interpreters being the mainstay of interpreter training programs online, then I'm afraid, at least as I look at the different pieces of the puzzle that I've presented, that is more of an illusion than a vision. Now, I frame my presentation as a question about the vision or illusion of online training of conference interpreters. But those who know me like know that I like to uh, uh, throw in a bit of a play fake from time to time. And for those who paid very close attention, you might have noticed that the real question is how on earth do we get from professional to expert interpreters with no sort of institutionalized or formalized deliberate practice happening once these kids are sent out into the wild? Thank you. And maybe, thank you. Thank you very much, Kilian. Much food for thought. I hope uh, there'll be plenty of questions. Um, I, have, uh, I have a question to our, our technical supporters. Um, Karen relayed the questions from the audience, but I wonder, um, can we test the questions? Can Kilian actually hear the questions from the audience, or do I need to relay them? Uh, if there are long questions, then I'd rather this, the, those who ask questions come over here and ask them. So, uh, can somebody test? Um, no? Well, first of all, I would like to ask if there are any questions. <laughs> any questions or comments, indeed. Uh, why not?
comment on Killian's um, proposition? Uh, Matthew. Matthew, do you want actually, uh, do you want to come here? It, it'll be, you're so close so that uh, it'll be easier if he comes and just speaks to me. Hi, thanks very much for that. Uh, very, very interesting presentation. I just wanted to ask a question about this uh, classification into the four categories. So the self, peer, tutor, trainer. By the time one has become a trainer, one often finds that one's former students have become tutors or even trainers themselves. So clearly there's some degree of flexibility in terms of people moving from one category to another. And depending on personality, you can find you, that you have students who are already uh, accomplished at giving feedback almost on a par with a tutor. You can't take it for granted. But I was just interested in whether you thought those lines could be blurred sometimes. Uh, hi, Matthew. Uh, I think that's a very good question. And you already uh, gave the answer, basically. Um, the the four categories, as they're part of a model, um, are an ideal. And obviously the lines blur uh, between what, well, the student I think is the easiest one because nobody else can be the student him or herself. Um, peers, I think, is an interesting category. And uh, on one of my slides, you might remember, I, I asked a provocative question, um, is every student a peer? Uh, are, are there peers of different levels? Is the fact that I'm engaging in the learning process towards the same objective enough to make me a peer? Um, then tutors, and that is probably the most difficult category, and one that changes the most quickly. But in trying to give you a a facetious answer to the question whether I, I uh, have not had the experience of a student, a particularly bright student, um, perhaps being on par with a trainer in terms of the feedback they provide. Well, does that mean we have an excellent student or does it mean we have a mediocre trainer? from the audience, any more comments? Fernanda, can you try the mic to see if, if um, Killian is actually here? Hi Killian, do you hear me? Can you hear Fernanda? No, you can't. you can't. Do you want to come here? Yeah. It will be much easier. I'm very sorry about that. But, uh, so, so far technology has worked very well with just one tiny fluke, but uh, questions seem to be challenging. Hi, Killian. Fernando Hi, Fernando. From here. Sorry, you had to stay in Geneva. Um, yeah. Uh, well, my question is the obvious question. Uh, where do you see the institutions in that uh, beautiful uh, scheme? And trainers <laughs> from institutions, what are they? They are occasional trainers, but are they trainers? Are they tutors? What are they? <laughs> Thank you. What? what? What a laden question. It is so short, but it is so laden. Um, <laughs> perhaps the, the easier one first. Um, I think the institutions can play a role um, if, uh, if only in the sense of something they tried doing a while back with promoting uh, what was then called Pedagogical assistants, TS, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and they would sponsor. Um, I think it was recent graduates uh, to go to uh, a training program and and be in residency for uh, for six months or a year. Um, back then, it was rather basic in its conception. As first and foremost. As I remember it, it was a matter of providing speeches in a particular language. I think that 
if there are such young graduates who do not have a full schedule yet because they do not work every day yet. And the, 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 lucky are the few who at this day and age graduate and have a full uh, workload as interpreters. So those might be interested in getting trained up. That would be something that would have to be front-loaded. They would have to get trained up to find out more about what they are now able to do. Because the intuitive component is what you're trying to minimize. Uh, it is only once the trainer has fully understand why certain things happen, how they happen, and when they happen, that the trainer sets him or herself apart from the non-trainer. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that is something that could, give some, could be given some thought to by, by the institutions, I believe. And it need not happen in residency. It can be, uh, uh, you know, people who, I don't know, I'm trying to, to uh, think on my feet now, um, the people who are in Brussels already um, and who are uh, young graduates and they're starting to get work, but they have a fairly open schedule and maybe an online system can be devised uh, whereby they intervene as tutors, again, once they have been trained up on better understanding the process and better understanding some pedagogical principles, but having the skill acquired and having the right language combination and being more available um, and hopefully also being remunerated for it, uh, contribute to the promotion of, of uh, the next generation. That's how I would see it. And then the second part of the question, um, what are today's trainers? Um, it, I, I, I do not know. Uh, <laughs> they come in all uh, shapes and, and, and sizes. Um, you know as well as I do that some people are natural born teachers. They just have uh, a, a certain ease and communicating, that doesn't mean that even natural born teachers or communicators can't improve their communication skills. I think what is most often, shall we say, worthy of improving is really their understanding of the process. And I see this time and again when with our masters um, of advanced studies and interpreter trainers, when asked what was the most eye-opening component of the program you took? They say it's a diagnostics. Mm -hmm. It's playing house. It is seeing three or four symptoms and eliminating what the most unlikely causes are and narrowing down the most likely causes and then try to act on those. Because a bit like, and I, I do not go so far as to compare conference interpreters with, with neurosurgeons. Uh, I'm a conference interpreter, I am not a neurosurgeon. It's a bit like the, the story uh, of the difference between God and the neurosurgeon, and the only difference is that uh, uh, God never thought he was a neurosurgeon. Um, um, so, so I do not think I'm a neurosurgeon, but we, we apply some of the same principles in that it is approximative, it is detective work, and it's not an exact science. Uh, the medical field is a lot larger, is a lot older, has a lot more people working in it, and much more is at stake. And that's what makes a difference, I believe. Mm -hmm. No, but I actually meant to ask you. The trainers, of course, there are gifted trainers and less gifted trainers uh, <laughs> among our trainers, of course. But do you see them uh, more in the online element or in the person-to-person -person element? That's what I meant to ask. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I think it has to be a mix. Mm -hmm. I think... I think more often than not, it has to be a mix. Um, I am speaking from what some would consider the ivory tower. I'm speaking from a very privileged position, mm -hmm. being at a training program that is in the middle of a flood of international organizations with lots of human resources available to me. And I'm in the lucky position that people want to come and train at my program. I don't have to go look for them. But most uh, training programs are not because of usually reasons that are outside of their own volition. So for those programs, I think you have to look at the model and think about how much 
well, how large is the contribution by trainers? How large is the contribution in terms of feedback given on the deliberate practice uh, paradigm um, of peers, of tutors, and of the students themselves? And there, I think, um, it's, when everything's said and done, also a mathematical truth mm -hmm. that you can't have trainers there on site. Having said that, the question is, is it worth investing, I don't know, 100 units to pay a trainer to be present online five times? Or are those 100 units spent more wisely by engaging a tutor who can be present either online or on site 25 times? And, and that's, that, that's a question, the answer to which I don't have. Thank you. Yes, that is an open question. We can go and think about it, but our time is up. Thank you so much, Kilian. And uh, it's, we, I think we're happy with the quality. Yes. Yeah, there you are. <laughs> Vote of confidence in technology. Thank you so much. And, Again, thank you very much. And I uh, hope next time around it'll be in person. Okay, all the best. We'll be in bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.